This is Jim. Who's hey, this? Hey, Jim, it's Zach Martin. How you doing? Hey, Zach, you're just the man I needed to talk to. Right, and I, I called a little bit earlier. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, I, I, I missed that, but I, I, we're, we're, we're good now, right? Yeah, no, we're fine. We're fantastic. So the, right. only, the only question I have before we start, is it Peterick or Peterick? I mean, we're having Peterick. fights here. Peterick. Peterick. I was right. Let me, let me just say this. Patrick, you, you were wrong. I was right. <laughs> Uh, my, my producer, we were like going, we're, nah, it's Peterick. And he goes, it's Peterick. And I'm like, no, I think it's Peterick. So now we had to call and find out. So well, uh, as, long, as long as the checks come to my mailbox, I give a shit. You know, you know what I mean? I'm the same way. I mean, <laughs> so my, my boss one time, because I use a um, last name from my stage name, so to speak. Right. So my boss right. goes, well, what does your wife call you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dude, yeah. What do you think she calls me? A hole, you know. <laughs> hey, that, that's, that's what my wife calls it. Hey, you get off the couch. All right. Well, yeah. let's let's get started. All right. You got it. It's the Big Fat American Radio Network. I'm Zach Martin with our special guest today, Jim Peterick, who is <laughs> an, an an amazing musician. And we can go on and on about your career, but what I like to do, uh, P, uh, Jim, is to have everybody do their own rock bio. This way, we a different side of the artist. Now, I know that you were a founding member of Survivor. Am I right about that? Uh, yep, a okay. co-founder, uh, okay, as good. we call it. Yep. All right, and I know that uh, you've uh, been involved with all different types of musicians. I know that you had an album out last year or a few years ago. I, I forget what the name of it. It was, um, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay. Wind of, winds of Change? No, no. Winds of Change. Just, that's a that new one. came up. That now let me let me, let me let me let me think about it. What was the last one? World well, stage. Was, that's it. No, world stage is the current one. Come on, Zach. All right, wait a minute. Where are we now? All right, forget it. I give up. Why don't well, you just tell was, us uh, your rock and roll bio, and then we'll get to your yeah, new music. Was, the, probably the one you're thinking of is Pride of Lions in in 2017. That was it. Is, Pride of the Lions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which did real well. Uh, you know, Pride of Lions is a, a band. I when I left Survivor in in '96. Uh, um, you know, what do I do now kind of thing. And I created two projects. One is World Stage. And we did our first concert in uh, in the year 2000. And I called up some of my closest friends, many of whom are really on this brand new album. People like Don Barnes and Kelly Kagi and Mike Reno and Kevin Cronin. And, and we just did this amazing concert. And World Stage became a yearly event in, in my career. We had an album on 2002. Uh, and Lately, Serafino Perugino, he might be Italian, uh, called me from my label Frontiers and said, Maestro, it's time for another world stage album. You know, and I go, yeah, cool. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, again, I circled the wagons. And this time I made some brand new friends, people like Danny Vaughn of Taiketo and Lars of, of a Work of Art from Sweden, Jason Sheff, formerly of Chicago, the Nelson Twins. Uh, you know, and, and, and I called everybody and, and a lot of them came to Chicago to work and I would fly out to various places if, if they didn't want to come to Chicago and freeze. Uh, so I, I made a trip to Atlanta, I wrote with Don Barnes and, and Danny Chauncey of, of, um, of 38 special. Uh -huh. And, you know, and, and a lot of these people, uh, Zach have precedent in my career. We're talking about my long career. It's definitely been a long career. And I've been blessed with a lot of great friends. Uh, around 1981, I got together with 38 Special. And uh, me and Don Barnes and Jeff Carlisi, when he was still with that band. And the first time we got together, we caught lightning in a bottle and wrote a, wrote a song called Hold On Loosely, uh, which, you know, became an enormous hit and is still uh, in their repertoire. And then we wrote Hold On, uh, Caught Up In You, which did the same thing. Rocking into the night, wild eyed Southern boys, fantasy girl. It was just a, a, a great streak. So, um, a lot of the people on this new record, uh, I have a long, long history with. Oh, that's fantastic. But let's go back even further. Cause now, now that you're talking, I do remember a lot more than uh, you're talking about. There was a group Ides of March, right? And, uh, yeah, the yes, song, uh, you're my vehicle, baby. That's you, um, right? Great God in heaven, you know I love you. Yes. Yeah, that's great stuff. And now I think I've I've discovered that one long ago 
No, I, I collect 45s. I collect really weird stuff. I have a lot of things in my garage. And I remember this Golden Nuggets box set. Yeah. I don't even know if it's available anymore. And that's where I'm like, oh, look at this. The Ides of March. Yeah. I'm a vehicle. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a great n- song. Nugget, nuggets, yeah. I must have gotten like $14 on that sale. That's very cool. Well, that's one of the things that people don't understand, that just because a guy has a gold record or even a platinum record on the wall, that doesn't mean they're swimming in dough, that they have a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, I've been blessed. You know, I'm, there's about 15 songs that, that keep my lights on here in, at my house. Um, you know, number one, I guess, would be Eye of the Tiger. Mm-hmm. Then uh, perhaps Rocky IV, uh, Burning Heart, then Search is Over, Hold On Loosely. And right about number five is Vehicle. And that's the gift that keeps giving. So do you, and, get, uh, do you get a nickel every spin? How does that work? Just curious. Well, nowadays, it's all digital. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it, it's all you know, it's almost better in a way because in the old days, disc jockeys used to fudge it and they used to forget they played it. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was very loosey-goosey. <laughs> yes, I and know. <laughs> that might happen, you know. And now it's all like you got to log it in. And actually, my ASCAP checks have been actually better now in, in the digital age. But look, I, I was in a sweet spot of, of music in the 70s and 80s. 1970 was Vehicle. And the 80s, of course, was dominated by, uh, by my, my action. Uh, and that was when records were selling, when you could actually make a buck uh, selling records and uh-huh. being a songwriter. And uh, it gets harder and harder. You know, Spotify is, is a great medium for getting your songs out, but... They don't particularly pay very well. Yeah, well, yeah. welcome to the radio world. Do you think we make any money? <laughs> That's for sure. Right, right. Uh, it's got to be a labor of love, you know. Yeah. One of uh, the songs that you were involved with ended up on South Park. Do you know which one that was? I'll just give you a little moment just to figure it out if you know, if you, if oh, you remember. Oh, was that Eye of the Tiger? One, no, no. Well, that no. might have been too, but it was heavy metal. No, shoot. Yeah, ah. it was on there, and it, the episode is Major Boobage. Where they're uh, they're tripping out on cat urine, and that's one of my it's one of my daughter who is like she's just turning nineteen, but she was maybe ten years old when she discovered that episode. One of her favorites, and what they do is they spoof the movie Heavy Metal from uh, 1980, 81. It's hilarious. You got to check that out one of these days. You know that is very funny because I hadn't heard of that. And uh, five, uh, four four or five days ago, I uh, I had some March. Uh, opened up for Sammy Hagar in Cleveland. And, of course, we were backstage. We were reliving that moment when we got together at his Mill Valley house back in 81 and, you know, fueled on Kona coffee uh, with a little tequila mixed in, we uh, we wrote heavy metal. And it was just like boom, boom. It was like fireworks. You know, I said 50,000 watts of power, and it's pushing over. Oh, my low. gosh. That, that, is a, that, that is a fantastic song. It really is. And here's a couple things about Sammy. Yeah. He is the same age. I don't know if you've seen these memes on social media, on Facebook or what have you. He is the same age as former President Bill Clinton. And I look at the both of them. I'm like, you know what? If I had to choose, I'd rather be a rocker in Cabo San Lucas than be a president of the United States any day. Cause, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, S- Sammy is forever young. Uh, I try to adopt that same philosophy. You know, I've got the purple hair now. And, yeah. and I'm r- rocking it. and. Sammy is is like my hero because he's not only a great rock star and an unbelievable singer guitarist, but he's a genius with marketing. You know, he, he pocketed eighty million from his tequila. Cabo Labo yeah, sale, that's good know? stuff. Uh, and by the way, it's very popular because I was at uh, some burrito place in a in a suburb of New Jersey, and I ordered that uh, tequila, and they were always out of it. So uh, that, that's good rock and tequila. Now, I'm going to start a little trouble. We're with Jim uh, Pederick. And I have Peter a question. Peterick. Now I'm doing what Patrick told me. This is it's Patrick Van Burak's fault. Okay. It's the producer of yours. Yes. He's also a musician, but anyway. Cool. Um, a lot of times I, I will ask a question, and sometimes it'll get picked up by the various trade magazines because it seems like it's one of those hot topics, Jim. And yeah. here it is. All right. What is your favorite version of Van Halen? With David Lee Roth on lead vocals oh, or Sammy Hagar? See, oh, I, man, I, that, I'm doing it now. I'm doing it again. We're causing trouble. That is so so loaded with with problems. Yes. Holy crap. Uh-huh. 
You know, I, what, do I like the Cubs or the Sox? Hey, you know what? <laughs> I got to love them both, man. I live in this town. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, um, look, you know, for sheer energy, you know, that when they came out, you know, David Lee Roth, come on. You can't beat a showman who learned everything he had from, you know, big <laughs> Jim Dandy of Black Oak, Arkansas. The guy was on fire, man. And, and all I can say is, you know, some of that early stuff still has the most energy of any any stuff they ever put on. How are you going to fill those shoes? If there's any way you could do it, it's Sammy Hagar. Now, he had a more melodic edge to it. He made it even more commercial. And he, but he rocked too, man. I'm not going to go on, on, on record. I love them both. Okay. I really do. You know, maybe you should just run for president or something because that is a great uh, safe political answer. You, you got the Republicans and Democrats all on your side. I wish, uh, I, I, wish I could do that. You know, well, I, you know, I hedged my bet, but I do love them both. Okay. And I didn't get to see them on stage together, but that had to be pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Well, the whole Sam and Dave thing. Now, I will tell you this, that um, I'm with you, that it's it's apples and oranges is my answer. The one thing I really like about Sammy Hagar, and you can tell him Zach Martin said this, as far as his musicality and what he brought to Van Halen, I thought it changed the dynamics of the band in very good ways. In other words, they were going to sit around doing what after David Lee Roth split? Whatever the reason right. was, what were they going to do? So they have to go out. I think you're right. They got the, the perfect guy at the right time, and I like the lyrics. I like his guitar play. I like what Sammy does, and he's a showman on stage as well. Having said that, every time I listen to a Sammy Hagar song, and I'm rocking out to it, like uh, one of my another one of my favorite, uh, my daughter's favorite, my, uh, my daughter Sophie, uh, she likes Cabo Wabo from OU812. In the right. Rome, Dallas, Texas. And I'm like, yeah. in the Rome in Dallas, Texas? And I started <laughs> talking to the song. I'm, Rome, <laughs> Dallas, Texas, Sammy. And then, yeah. you know, and then he's talking about uh, uh, white sand, show him, make a tan look nice. Lots of pretty girls coming by the dozen. And then when he starts starts to sing about making love in the in the ocean, I'm like, oh, gross. You just screwed the whole thing up. You took Titanic and put a love scene in it. Oh, come on, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell him you said that. Oh, my Isn't that God. great? I, I mean, I, I really have to, one of these days, meet Sammy in person. One of my favorites. Anyway, we're with Jim Peterick. Good. As opposed to what other people might say, Patrick, looking at Patrick, I'm, I'm giving him that side eye. A side eye yeah. is in the topic, is in the news now, uh, Jim. The, 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 the old side snake eye. eye. Yeah, snake, snake eye, eye yeah, whatever. Yeah. I'm giving them the Maloikia, the evil the Maloikia. eye. Yeah, the Maloikia. That's what he's getting. That's what he's getting right now. I, no, I, I think that's an Italian, or it could be Italian slash Jewish, you know. Oy vey. Yeah, oy vey. We got it going. So tell us about... Your new album. Now, I listened to one of the tracks a few times. Mm -hmm. Let me get my notes over here. I have to yeah. put on my spectacles. I got my spectacles. Yeah, I got tri testicles. So and... don't worry about oh, it. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Thing About Heaven. What's the name of that? Song? Proof of Heaven. All right. Proof of Heaven. There you go. So what led you to this whole concept of the Proof of Heaven? Heaven. Did something happen inside you? Do you have a, a spiritual awakening? What, 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 explain that. Uh, you know what? I mean... It's it's really you know a great collaboration between Dennis DeYoung and myself, and uh, I had been writing a, a new album with Dennis, who's going to put an album out later this year as a solo, uh, and it's great. It's everything that sticks, everything he brought to sticks, all those assets are in his solo album. He decided, you know what, I'm going to preach to the choir instead of trying to do something different than sticks. I'm going to do what I did in sticks, theatrical. Big ass choruses, lots of keyboards, you know the trick. Uh -huh. And in, in that process, we wrote a song called Proof of Heaven. And um, as, a, as he said, I want a song on your world stage album. How about this one? He said, You're kidding me. That's like m one of my favorite songs that we've been writing. And we finished it up and, and we recorded it. We collaborated on the lyrics, but it's really all about, you know, there's proof of heaven in every stranger's face. If you look for the good wow. in people, you know. Yeah. And that's really what, what it's all about. And we did the video, and I, if you saw the video, we're having a blast doing it. And, uh, you know, my son's on keyboards, and his guitar player is on the, the double neck, uh, August Zadra. And uh, it's it really doing well, I have to say. How would you, your, your sound is dynamic. In other words, what I mean by that, when you look at your history and all the different 
uh, combinations and their groups. It's not like, and, and I have some groups that I really enjoyed their first two albums, but when they get to the, to the third album, it was so predictable and sounded the same. And I don't want to mention them by name because it's not their fault. They were just doing what they thought was best. But what I like about you is how you seem to like change it up. You, you don't have like a, you know, like the old formula, uh, three second intro, 229, cold <laughs> out. You, you don't do the formulas. So what is your methodology of putting together a composition? Well, you know, methodology is right. I, I throw that out the window. I mean, if someone said, I of the Tiger has a 30 second intro and it's going to get on radio, you say, shut the door, you know, but it worked. Uh, it worked because it was perfect with the movie. You know, I, I coordinated every punch with a slash. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah. Bump, bump, bump. And there's even one that I screw oh. up every drummer when I wait. Bump, bump, bump. You know, and, and I was trying to coordinate the punches. But that's where a 30 second intro was, was needed. There are no rules. And, and the beauty part of, of writing with, uh, with this Winds of Change is that I get to be a member pro tem of all these different bands and try to bring out their particular uh, sound. You know, like when I was writing with Don Barnes, I wanted to update 38 Special, but I wanted to bring some of their root sound into it. Mm -hmm. And we we got together with uh, Winds of Change, which became the title cut. And Mike Reno, he did a show with me on World Stage, and he's a dear friend. I said, stay over four days. We're going to write a song. We're going to record it. He said, fine. So I, we were in the, in the writing, uh, well, the studio. We wrote in the studio, and I said, you know, when we were touring with you guys, I was Survivor, and you were still, well, Loverboy's still around, but you were with Loverboy. You had the red leather pants on yeah, and the headband. I, I, you know, I was just going right. to ask, do the red leather pants still fit, or oh, uh, did he have know, to on sell one, them? On one, I think on one leg they fit. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he's, he's put on a few LBs. Yeah, you know, yeah but, haven't we all? <laughs> yeah, you know, but the, the bandana still fits, which oh, is great. Oh, that's good. And he still rocks like an MF, you know. Uh -huh. And I said, let's capture that energy. The chicks in the first three rows with the, you know, see-through tops and blah, blah, blah. And we wrote without a bullet being fired. And it, I think it captures that energy. So with every band, I get to be that band. And I'm kind of a chameleon. I mean, I, I can, I'm inspired by so many forms of music. And I think, like you said, that's what keeps it fresh. Well, uh, let's talk about that. I, I read a lot of stuff uh, about you, and it seems like you're a, a pretty avid Beatles fan, right? Absolutely. Huge. What would, Huge. You, what would you say, and, and I've never met a person who didn't like the Beatles, and I <laughs> used to, I used to work with Scott Muni. You remember him? Yeah. Probably, yeah, right. So Scott would go, I don't hang out with anybody who doesn't like the Beatles because there's something wrong with them. <laughs> they ain't right in their head, fats. <laughs> so um, what is... When did you, when you heard the Beatles, at what point did you say, this is what I want to do? Oh, man. Well, I preceded at the Ed Sullivan show, the, 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 the stock answer, the, the true answer for most people is when I saw him at the Ed Sullivan show in February 63. Uh, but for me, it was early 63. Uh, and Jack Parr, The Tonight Show, brought some grainy footage from the BBC and there was this long-haired band called the Beatles, black and white. The girls are screaming, and they're doing She Loves You, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it changed my effing life. And I ran to the record store the, uh, the following Monday, and I said, do you have anything about the Beatles? And she laughed, and no, I don't think so. I said, well, get ready. Huh. Uh, it, and then we saw him in Ed Sullivan, the Eyes of March, which were then called uh, the Shondells. We had our first rehearsal watching the Ed Sullivan show. And we we signed up. We said, this is it. They're good looking. They get all the girls. They write their own material. Hell yeah. And uh, that's what set the Ides of March uh, on, on track. Oh, cool. When was your, what was your first concert that you saw as a kid and who took you? The Beatles. Oh, really? Beatles. So tell us yeah. about that. Because a lot of people well, it, don't, yeah. don't ever say that, right? There's a very few people that I know that... It, their first concert was the Beatles. So tell us about that. I was very, very lucky. Uh, all the Ides of March went. There was one guy in the band that was actually old enough to drive. We went in a <laughs> Chevy station wagon to Comiskey Park, his afternoon concert. 
Uh, the Beatles were on the bill with, um, you know, a lot of bands that, you know, Cannibal and the Hun- Headhunters and bands that no one was listening to. Even if you could hear them, no one would listen to them. And finally, these, these four little tiny figures dart across home plate and get up on the stage and, and sing their asses off into a, like six, you know, those crummy uh, yeah. banana speakers yeah. that stand by Electric uh-huh. Boys. They had 12 of those. And that was supposed to cover the whole arena. Didn't matter. The screams would have covered it anyway. Chaos. People were crying. And when they hit that harmony on Babies in Black, I lost it. I started crying like a baby oh. because it was so damn beautiful. Did, and you, it, it, did, you know, you ever, did you ever get to meet any of the Fab Four? I did. Um, I only met two. I met George Harrison at a party in L.A. Yeah, uh, I had some merch. had a number one record called Vehicle back right. in 70, as you know. And we went to a Hollywood party, uh, and George was there. And we stood in a queue, and we all shook his hand. And I said something tongue-in-cheek because I knew that he would laugh. I said, you guys were really good on Ed Sullivan. <laughs> it was the most stupid thing, I, I, and I wanted to say the most stupid thing ever, and he bust out laughing because so much had happened be- between then and now, you know. Uh, and then the second brush with greatness was uh, the, the 20th uh, anniversary of Sgt. Pepper. I flew over with a, a bunch of great radio listeners to uh, uh, from a station called The Loop in Chicago. Uh-huh. And Bob Stroud, my friend and DJ, brought me as a part of the uh, the crowd. And my wife and I uh, got to be at the reception, uh, Abbey Road Studio Two, right where they, you know, where the control room's up high, you know. And there was Sir Paul. He wasn't Sir yet. And uh, and I got to I got to shake his hands. I was spellbound and tongue tied. And uh, I said very very awkwardly. He, I'm the guy that uh, did Eye of the Tiger. Oh, I, the I Tiger. love that song. It's my favorite the, song. I like that. It's really good. He, he just, yeah. You know, pretty much, but he said, good one, mate. <laughs> and that was it. Well, in all fairness, you have on your hands with the Eye of, of the Tiger a great stadium song. I don't think that I've ever been to an arena or a sporting event or a stadium where a din, 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 din comes in, yeah. you know, at one point or another, especially if you're at an Eagles game, I'm sure. Um, now, you know, I, I I like you, I, I got to meet some of the Beatles and I got to interview some of the Beatles and I I'm with you. You got to come up with something to say that's memorable. And I'm sort of like Tommy boy when it comes to those situations. I don't know. (laughs) Oh my God. You know, uh, but I was able to control myself. Now I did, I did a great job. I must say myself interviewing Ringo for Ringo Rama. We got along great. Then I was able to ask him about coming to the United States for the very first time. And he goes, we were high at 35,000 feet. And I thought that was cool. And then, <laughs> and then when Wingspan was out, I got to go with Scott Meany to uh, interview Paul McCartney. We were the only two that were allowed to interview Paul McCartney in person. Everything else was, you know, one of those cattle calls that they do on ISDN or over the phone like we are now. And I, I noticed that the food there was only vegetarian, vegan, even worse than vegetarian, vegan. Even worse. Right. Yep. So we get on the elevator. It's me, Paul and Scott. And I go, um, you know, I got to tell you something. Your spread was awful. He goes, well, I'm a vegan. I go, yeah, but Scott and I aren't. Couldn't you throw in some roast beef or turkey? He's like, no, <laughs> I never eat that. And another thing, Paul, I went, I start now I'm on a roll. I go, all those women are downstairs. They're, they're waiting for you. They're, they're crying. They're fainting. They're passing out. I mean, they're wait. A lot of girls, all different ages, beautiful women. Why are you getting remarried? I would never get married again. And Scott goes, yeah, well, you deserve exactly what you're going to get. And I go, like, you would know you got married twice. And so he goes, I love her. And I go, but <laughs> that love is going to cost you a half a billion dollars. So I'd like to think that while he was going through all of that with Heather Mills, that I was yeah. one of the first person that he thought about. One of the first person. You know, you, you got brass galleon. <laughs> you really do. I mean, to say that to, to Sir Paul... Very cheeky. I like that. Well, you see, here's the thing, uh, Jim. I, I, I think I treat everybody equally. I, it doesn't matter whether they're a pauper or a prince to me, yeah. fellow human beings. And I respect them all. And when I kid with somebody, that means I really feel comfortable around them and I really do like them. So that's, that's my way of sharing love. And that's what it's all about. If I met the president of the United States, uh, hello, Mr. President, shake his hand. 
And then maybe I'd ask him a couple of questions. Like what I would want to do if I ever got to the White House is like in Forrest Gump, I'd want to use the toilet. That's all. And then send out a tweet because I got a feeling that our president tweets from the toilet. And that's what I would like to do. Oh, you know, I never thought of that. I hate that thought. Yeah, I mean, really, that, that's what people do. So I'm, I'm thinking like it's at a specific time every day. And I'm thinking, oh, it must be the morning constitution. Here it goes. Tweeting from the toilet. You know, I, I just can't, uh, I can't unsee that. Yep, uh, see there. Neck. So just like no. Paul couldn't unsee what I told him in the elevator. Anyway, well, um, well you know, Heather, Heather had a leg up on that one. Oh, anyway. oh, oh, oh now that was cheeky. It was bad. Yeah. Very so bad. let me ask you this. Uh, the next time you come to New York, I was hoping that you can take me shopping for clothes. Because, Not a problem. Yeah, I, I just need a, I need a makeover. And we can do a whole video series of uh, you making me over. So I, well, I think that would be great. It would be a hit. Well, you know, when, when I was in Survivor, I was the fat girl. You know, I was the guy. Oh, yeah, keyboard. I understand. Yeah, That's been my life. Keyboard, you know, be, be, uh, behind the amplifiers. Uh, whereas with the Eyes of March, when I was 19, I'm the freaking front man uh, prancing around the stage with my guitar. Well, that all changed with the uh, the kind of, um, you know, kind of the game plan of, of Survivor. It became a, a different thing. Mm-hmm. And lead singer and, and uh, some wooden Indians in back of them. Uh, and, I, you know, it was good. It was a great band, huge success. Uh, Dave Bickler, the first singer, was, you know, sang Eye of the Tiger. And then Jimmy Jameson came in and nailed it. Uh, the late Jimmy Jameson passed away five years ago, tragically. But he's the guy that's saying, you know, hi, on you, I can't hold back, search is over. Uh, I mean, he could sing the phone book and, and make you believe it. Uh, but the point is, when I left the band in 96, I, I wanted to reclaim that the front man, rock star, purple hair, cool clothes, custom made, this and that, the spokesperson for the Eyes of March. I, I needed that back. And uh, and that's where I'm at now. Well, I think, you, I, I think you look fantastic. And um, you know how everybody these days they identify with this gender and that gender and they... I mark on my form that I'm binary. I don't even know what that means. And on top of that, I would like to say that I identify not with being in my mid-thies, but as uh, 35. I identify as 35. How about that? Well, I like that. I identify with 19. All which right. Is a, That's good. It, 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 you know, that was my, I was happening, you know, and I, I hearken back to that. Opening up for Led Zeppelin with the Ides of March. We're in Winnipeg. Holy shnikes. And, yeah. And we had the night of our life. We got a standing ovation after every song. They loved us. Uh, Randy Bachman was in the audience, so I got to ask him about 10 years ago, were we really that good or am I dreaming? He goes, you were really that good. Zeppelin comes on. They had a bad night. They Uh were all PO'd about the PA system. They were probably Uh half-whatevered. And the headline the next day, Ides of March steal the show. So when I'm in a down mood, wow, I'll think of that that night and the magic of that. When did you realize uh, that Led Zeppelin was a really good cover band? <laughs> I knew that right away. <laughs> See, now we caused trouble with Van Halen and now we're causing trouble with Led Zeppelin, right? Isn't that's that great? Okay. Does it get I, any better? I heard that, listen, when I heard that first Zeppelin album, I said, that's truth by Jeff Beck. Every song was the, the same arrangements. You shook me. This and that. I go, they commercialized what Beck's been doing for three years. Yeah, which was originally from Willie Dixon and various other old blues artists. Well, that's that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then if you get the chess box set by Willie Dixon, I think you'll hear just about every Led Zeppelin song for the first three albums. And then there were Led Zeppelin songs I had no idea that they were based on old blues songs, such as When the Levee Breaks is written by Memphis Minnie in the 1920s about the Mississippi floods. And I'm like, wow. And then Traveling Riverside Blues is a um, Robert Johnson song. I, I know. I, I just finished the, the book on uh, Jimmy Page. just came out. I read bios and autobiographies like candy. And I just finished this one. Very, very good. It tells that story about Memphis Minnie. I never knew that till then. Wow. So you learn something new every day. And he, I got, now, I did get mad at Jimmy Page. I interviewed him, and um, I what I'm getting tired about, Jim, is they always sell these remasters. So you buy yeah. the remasters only to find out that that's not the final remaster. That there's another remaster around the corner. And I went with them. I went to him. I go, "What is it with you and the remasters? I just spent ninety nine bucks on the whole collection, and now you're redoing the first 
you know, four or five albums. You're doing all, all of these studio albums. You're doing them again. He goes, and instead of answering the question, he goes, did you like it? I go, well, yeah, come to think of it, I did. Huh? So that was, the, that was the end of that. He, he knows how to, how to shut yeah. you up, that's for sure. He, he really does. Now, let's talk about your lineup on uh, Winds of Change. Did I get yeah. the name right? Yes, I did. You did. Okay, so you have, you're on uh, vocals, keyboard, and guitar. You mm-hmm. have Mike Aquino. Did I get that right? You, you got it. Oh, Aquino. Wow, how it. about that? Guitar, lead, and rhythm. Yeah. Ed Breckenfeld. Mm-hmm. Drums and percussion. Dave Kelly on drums. Well, you got a lot yeah. of drummers and percussion. Colin Peterick, which is, yeah, I guess, your, is that his son? Yeah. See, I think, this is great. Listen, you got three drummers, really. Three percussionists and three basses. You could have lent one to the doors back in the day, but that's for a different discussion. You got, <laughs> <laughs> you got Clem right. Hayes. You got Bill Senior. Signer. Signer. All right. Tell Bill Listen I screwed it. up his name. Uh, Bob Lizick. Yep. And Jeff Lance does the orchestral arrangements. Uh, yeah. You're always there. I mean, this is quite a lineup that you uh, put together for yourself. Well, it, it really is. It's the Chicago stable, you know, of, of the, the best guys, I think, in, in Chicago. And if one song is a little better for one drummer, one bass player, uh, I'll I'll choose that drummer. My my son really really killed it though. I, I, it's the first time I I let him <laughs> let him play on one of my records, and he plays on uh, the great song with, by the late Jim, Jimmy Jameson, which is kind of a story in itself. Where I, I cut this song with Jimmy in in '08, and it sat on a shelf, and it got I got distracted by an, another album I was doing with him. This song was more country oriented the way I, I um, recorded it, but I always loved this song called "Love You All Over the World." It's the final cut on this record, and um, I, I asked uh, his family if I could take his voice off and recut the track more in the rock style that Jimmy was so famous for, mm-hmm. and they said, "Absolutely, you got my blessing." So, man, I'll tell you, when I was in the studio with my my guys, and Colin was on the drums, and we soloed his voice. It was like being in the room with a ghost, you know, Whoa. and I, I had tears in my eyes and we kind of all did. And, uh, I, you know, I, I love this track. I, I'm really uh, anxious to hear uh, what you think of it and the world thinks of it because it's a I think it's a gem. Well, listen, if you think it's a gem, it's got to be a diamond. It's got to be, you. you know, the most amazing thing. And I can't wait to listen to it. And I'm going to give it an extra listen and, and really pay attention to the drums. And if I hear your son messing up, I'll let you know. But I'm sure <laughs> Uh, if, if you, if your son Colin was to say, who's the drummer that influenced the most, what would that drummer be? I'm very interested in that. Yeah. Well, he likes all the guys that play with Steely Dan. I, oh. I, you know, I don't know which one right now. He's got the number one, uh, uh, St- Steely Dan cover band in the Midwest called, uh, they're called the Brooklyn Charmers from that song. And they got him down cold. And, and my son Colin is like the Fagan singer and keyboardist. Uh So, you know, he lives and breathes them. So Bernard Purdy would probably be his number one guy. Oh, cool. See, you learn something new every day. Now, how old is Colin, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, he's 29. All right. Uh, Cute as a button and just so talented. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, He's got a stupid it doesn't but, matter how it doesn't matter how old they get. They're always cute as a button to the dad. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And I'm a granddad twice over, thanks to him and Meredith, which oh, is a lot of fun. Congratulations! So, yeah, yeah I, kind of, I, I think I think being a grandparent is the best because you can rile up all the kids, feed them sugar and candy, and then give them back to the parents. Oh man, yeah, they could be spinning out of control. Oh, See ya. Yeah, Bye. there's nothing better than that when you and then you and grandma are laughing all the way home. Right? No, no doubt. I, yeah. That sounds like spoken by a grandpa. Well, no, I'm not a grandpa, but I've analyzed and I've, I, I you know, a lot of my friends are grandpas. My daughter's yeah. a little too young for that right now. She's 19. She's going on 19. But right she's, on. she's got an old soul. She only likes classic rock. And she just, she's got a better collection than I do. I mean, it's just God amazing. God bless so her. I must have raised her right. Um, yeah. How obviously. does somebody, how does somebody follow you, Jim? Uh, jimpeterick.com is great. Uh, the official Jim Peterick page on Facebook. That's very current. I, I keep it up almost every day. Um, and you can find this record, of course, uh, on Amazon, Spotify, uh, that one local record store that America has now based in, uh, Poughkeepsie. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Poughkeepsie. Oh, I, you, 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 that's good. I like that. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, uh, but no, that, that's kind of where it's at, you know, and, and you can buy it on my website, jimpeterick.com oh. and the frontiers web- website, frontiers.it. Um, and it's doing really well. I mean, we've got some great singers on here. Uh, t- Danny Vaughn from Taiketo, Kevin Cronin, REO. Yeah. Uh, Dennis T. Young, not bad. Uh, the Nelson twins, uh, Jason Sheff, the great Chicago s- singer that replaced Satara for almost two decades. Uh, and I got to write, co-write most of these songs with these artists. Well, Toby I, Hitchcock from Pride of Lions. Yeah. Now, now, now I'm now I'm really interested because this is something that Scott Meany would have said. You know that band Chicago? They're all broke because there's so many of them. How can you make money? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So that's about right. Right. So I mean, in the spirit of Scott Muni, if you a go on the road, how do you get all these guys on stage at the same time? And how the hell do you make any money? Well, we're not going to get them all together in one stage. I mean, if I can get two at any one show, that's that's going to be great. Uh-huh. And uh, we really See. started in in January. This year, I'm, I'm mainly touring with the Ides of March. Uh, okay. 55 years of being a band together. Wow, that's Our amazing. Album dropping, uh, as they say, in August called, uh, called Play On. And we have guests like um, Mark Farner uh, of Grand Funk came in, in town. Joe Bonamassa, not a bad Oh, my gosh, player. he's great. Yeah. I know, I love him. And, and he's got this celloist, I think, a G- J.O. or something like that. Some, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, go I, ahead. I do. Yeah, and he's brilliant. No, it's a uh, she. Got- it's a, it's a, it's a, a chick. Oh, oh I, I, thought, I thought it was Yo-Yo Ma or something. No, no, no. It's some girl no. he's got on. T- I've seen the video anyway. She's really good. I, I follow her on hot? Facebook. Uh, well, oh, I don't, you know. Well, I'm, I'm a well, married guy. I'm not allowed to look. Whatever. Girls that you? play cellos wear pants like the fellows. But anyway. <laughs> no, she doesn't wear pants. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. That's, a good that's, thing. that's a good sign. Uh, what we t- oh, yeah. Kathy Richardson, lead singer Jefferson Starship, is on this record. David from Ambrosia. Yeah, it's it's going to be a great Ides of March record. So I'm doing a lot of promotion for that. The next year, I'm going to be promoting a lot of Ides of March live. I mean, uh, world stage live shows. Okay, cool. So what we'll do is we'll have you back, and then you know you can tell me what I missed this time. We'll get it the next time, and then I'll find something other something else uh, to talk about. And you know, it'll it'll be fun to for people to tune in and listen. That's what it's all about. Well, I I, I love what you do because you are old school. Jock, man, you, you're you're personable. You got personality. You got humor. You play great songs. Rock on, brother! Wow, oh, thank you very much. Thank you for stopping by and talking with us on the Big Fat American Radio Network. <laughs> I love it. I got one thing to say to you right now, Zach. Great God in heaven, you know I love, I love you, Zach Martin. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's awesome. 